No, oh, I'm the doing the informal part. part. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, next week, Alex Wiedenhoff from the Forest Products Lab will be here to talk about magnifying and identifying exotic woods with a handheld xylophone. I love a play on words. I love a play on wood. So uh, he's got this cool device where uh, he can take a cross section of wood, hold it up against there. He's got great optics. And as a wood anatomist, he can identify the species of the wood based on the xylem and foam patterns and all that cool stuff. So he's going to talk about not only that technology and how he applied it to a iPhone, so that people can use it anywhere, not just in the lab, um, but how important it is to be able to identify exotic woods so that you can trace the provenance of wood in international commerce. May 31st, Jennifer Van Oss from Animal and Dairy Sciences will be here to talk about giving dairy cows a voice through science. So this is part of the animal welfare research going on here at the university. And now I think I'm ready to go whenever you are, Lynn. Stand by. Stand by. Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome back to Wednesday night at the lab, but for the first time in real person, Professor Nam C. Kim. He's in the Department of Anthropology here. He's going to be speaking to us about exploring the legendary foundations of ancient Vietnam. He was born in Saigon, now known as Ho Chi Minh City, and went to high school in Lincoln Park High School in Chicago. He then went to the University of Pennsylvania for his undergraduate in international relations. He went to New York University to study political science for his master's, and then went to the University of Illinois Chicago to get his PhD in anthropology. He came here to be on the faculty at UW-Madison in 2010. I'm looking forward to his talk. It's a great combination of history and culture and archaeology and all kinds of cool stuff. Would you please join me in welcoming Nam C. Kim back to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom, it, it, it's a pleasure to be here in person. I know the last time we, we tried to do this, I was in my living room um, and we had the talk during the height of the pandemic. It's a privilege to be here and I want to thank, uh, thank uh, Tina as well from PBS Wisconsin for this opportunity. Uh, so for this lecture, I'm going to be your tour guide to take a, a, a look at a time and place in Vietnam that goes back a couple thousand years. So we're going to be looking at what a lot of people talk about as the sort of foundations and the underpinnings of an emerging Viet identity and civilization. And as backdrop, I just want to start to situate ourselves chronologically. So if we look at some areas that are probably more familiar to many of us, um, looking at the Mediterranean, for instance. So just so about 2,000 years ago, or a little bit before that, we're looking at the beginnings of the Roman imperial period. And for the Roman Empire, wherever they spread out outside of Rome, um, in some of these areas, they view the outside communities, the borderlands, as inhabited by what they would consider barbarians in need of civilizing. So along the fringes of the Roman world, we can talk about the Gauls, the Celts, and other communities within this Mediterranean region as those unwashed that needed to be civilized. And I want you to hold on to that thought because there's a, there's a similar theme. If we go right around the same time period, maybe a little bit before, across that Eurasian landmass out to the east, into areas of East Asia, to an area that would become modern-day China, 
If you look at this screen, you can see that little red shade in the middle. That little circle there is what's known as the central plains of China. And here, right around uh, the mid part of the first millennium BCE, we have what's known as the Warring States period. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this time period and this history. This is right around the time that we have Sun Tzu writing about the art of war. We have various kingdoms in the central plains and outside of it competing, vying for power and control over this territory of the Central Plains and beyond it. Now, during this time period, we see the end, a kind of culmination of conflict with the Qin, one of those ki competing kingdoms, the Qin taking over. Right? So this is right around the time that many different kingdoms have been building their own infrastructure. A lot of the uh, parts of the, what would eventually become the Great Wall of China are originally constructed by different societies at this time in piecemeal fashion, not necessarily related to one another. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Qin because the Qin Emperor, this kicks off the imperial dynasty, imperial period of Chinese history. When that emperor dies, he has his remains placed into this massive tomb that is made famous by the discovery of the terracotta soldiers. So this is right at that time period of around 221 BCE, where we have the culmination, the start of this imperial history. And after his death, within a couple of decades, the Qin dynasty is replaced by what's known as the Han dynasty. And this is the backdrop for our story today. Because when we think about the connections between the area of northern Vietnam, what would become northern Vietnam in, in, in the modern day, there is a very complicated relationship between the Han people and the people just to the south. Because the Han Empire, as it comes into power, begins to expand its reach beyond the the kind of reach that the, the, the Qin had, and they start to encounter what they consider to be the barbarians of their fringes. So we have expansion into the west, into parts of uh, what would become Mongolia, into the Korean Peninsula, and down into what's known as the Red River Valley area. And in this kind of expansion, we have people that are encountering these other communities that are writers, colonialists, who talk about the barbarians in these fringe areas who are in need of being civilized. So we have the expansion of the Han Empire and dynasty, and I just want to highlight a couple of places in particular. So you can see in the yellow shaded areas, in the northeast we have the Korean Peninsula, and then in the south, that is what would eventually become northern Vietnam. And this is what's known as the Red River Delta and Valley area. So those are two of the kind of barbarian hotspots that we can point to uh, for the Han. Now, if you'll indulge me for just a second, uh, Tom mentioned that I was born in Saigon. So I, I have mixed ancestry, and some would say I have mixed barbarian ancestry because my father is Korean, as you might have guessed from my last name, and my mother is Vietnamese. They met in Vietnam in the 1960s, um, in 1967, eventually, uh, fell in love, got married, and I was born in 1974. So for those of you that are familiar with the history of Vietnam, the modern history, you know that this is right around the time that the, the, the war starts coming to an end. And within a year of my birth, April 29th, 1975, we see the fall, not just of Saigon, but the entire state of South Vietnam. This is the history that we have. And it was that day, April 29th, um, right before April 30th, which was the actual day that Saigon is toppled, uh, my, my parents and I, and I don't remember any of this, I was an infant at the time, but we evacuated out of Saigon from the U, uh, USAID rooftop by helicopter. This is part of what's known as Operation Frequent Wind. Um, you can see on the screen here, that's an image um, on the top right, not of our evacuation, this is a, a, another famous photograph taken by Hubert Van Ness of a similar kind of evacuation that was occurring on the same day. But that was the method that we escaped as refugees. And that picture, uh, the larger picture, that is me uh, with my mother. After we had evacuated, gotten out to the coast, and eventually from the coast out to sea to various refugee camps across the Pacific before ending up in the United States. Uh, we were part of what's known as Operation New Life. And this was based in Guam. And we were processed as refugees through that area and then eventually ending up in the United States. I tell this story because for me, 
it, there are two main reasons to relate this. One is it's a privilege to be able to go back now, having had the upbringing that I've had, having had the opportunities I've had, to go back and work on Vietnamese history. This is something that my parents never dreamed would be possible having left the country under those circumstances. The other reason I tell this story is because my mother's family hails from the northern part of the country originally. So if you look at this photograph, this is all the members of her, her, her family in the 1950s up in the Ningbing province. And this is my mother right here. I think you can see she's about um, six or seven years old at the time. But on that side of the family, what we're going to be talking about today, this journey that we're going to be exploring, uh, all of this was communicated as history, as fact. It's taught in school books, it's in textbooks, it's taught to uh, school children. That was the case decades ago. It still is the case today. And this takes us to the next part of the lecture, the story of early Vietnam. What I want to emphasize here is there is a very interesting connection, as we talked about at the beginning, between an emerging Chinese or Sinitic civilization and an emerging Viet Vietnam. This is a very long and complicated history. It goes back millennia, and it still persists to this very day. So if we think about this idea of annexation or colonization by the north and this view of barbarians to the south, the Vietnamese people, many in Vietnam today, view this very complicated relationship as one defined by resistance uh, to Chinese cultural domination or dominance. This goes back to the Han Empire 2,000 plus years ago. And once the Chinese came, once the Han Empire annexes this part of uh, of the Red River Valley and Delta that we'll be talking about, they would stay, their presence would stay for about a, a thousand years before there is independence regained right around the, the end of the first millennium of the Common Era. There was a very recent piece, um, uh, op-ed written in the New York Times by sociologist Tim Lai, and I'll just paraphrase, but he, he basically argues that the Vietnamese have been fighting for millennia to maintain independence, to maintain their culture in the shadow of this giant neighbor to the north. To me, this is very interesting to think about when we compare the uses of history and the material record for various purposes. This is particularly acute in many places around the world, especially in areas where we have turmoil, self-determination, and history that can be tied to national identity. So if we think about 20th century history in Vietnam, with all of the conflicts, with resistance against the French, with resistance against the Japanese, and then conflicts in the Civil War, uh, this is particularly poignant. This is a tapestry that shows uh, legendary descriptions about the founding communities or dynasties of the Viet civilization. This is what's known as the Vân Lung Kingdom. This purportedly exists for thousands of years. The reason that I think this is interesting to think about is because that tapestry hangs today inside uh, what's known as the Reunification Palace. This was formerly the South Vietnamese uh, presidential offices, now labeled, relabeled as Independence or Reunification Palace. Those, those uh, kings of the Vân Lung Kingdom were talked about. They were brought up in speeches by people like Ho Chi Minh, who talked about the prehistoric or legendary eras of the Viet people and said, basically, this is in uh, Bading Square in 1945, uh, when he declares independence against the Japanese. And he says, these folks are part of our ancestry. They're in the past. We are the descendants of those legendary kings. So there's a very interesting connection between the legendary past and present day political identity. To geographically orient ourselves, we're talking about this part of what is Vietnam today. This is the Red River Valley in Delta. It's considered to be the crucible of an emerging Viet identity a couple thousand years ago. And when we think about reconstructions of this history, we're talking about a mix of oral traditions, folk tales, historical texts, and ar increasingly, archaeology. There are legendary kingdoms like the one I just described, as well as what's known as the Olak Kingdom. And this is increasingly uh, part of a tapestry of research that includes archaeology. So we have what's known as the Dongsun culture and a site known as Golua. I'll talk about both here uh, today. I'll start with what's known as the Dongsun culture. 
The Dongsan culture is renowned for various kinds of cultural practices that date to just over 2,000 years ago, the mid first millennium BCE. One of those practices has to do with the uses of boats for uh, burials. And within these burials, we have high status elite individuals with lots of materials, uh, very valuable prestige items, oftentimes made out of bronze. So we have different kinds of vessels, utilitarian tools, weapons, and so forth. The Dong Sun culture was spread out all over northern Vietnam. To date, there have been maybe over 100 different sites that have been identified, workshops, settlements, as well as burials and cemeteries. We know that they were farming rice intensively. We know that they were very sophisticated in their bronze industries. We have evidence of social ranking between individuals within communities based on the kinds of uh, burials that we can make out, the mortuary data. We have evidence that some of the homes were probably built on stilts above the floodplains. Uh, and this is not surprising given the intensive kinds of rice production that we see in this region. And of course, we have those very famous bronzes. And we have images of boats depicting different ways of life. Some of these boats have warriors standing on them uh, with plumed feathered headdresses. So we have this very interesting set of cultural practices. The material remains, as I mentioned, include sophisticated bronzes like these, ritual vessels, utensils, weaponry. And perhaps the most famous of the bronzes associated with the Dong Sun is what's known as the bronze drum. There are various specimens that have been found all throughout northern Vietnam, even parts of southwestern China. Uh, these bronze drums are very big in size, and some of them are probably about this tall in height, uh, maybe up about 100 to 150 pounds in weight. And the most famous, one of the most famous of these specimens is this one on the bottom right. This was found at the site of Koh Lua, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. That particular one was about 158 pounds. And the estimate is anywhere from 1,000 to 7,000 kilograms of crude ore material, copper, tin, and other materials, that would have been necessary to produce this one specimen. So we have very sophisticated forms of bronze working kind of at their peak in this region at this time. And if you look at the iconography on some of these bronzes, particularly the bronze drum, what you can make out on the tympanum, for instance, or on some of the bands around the sides, are images showing us potential life ways, cultural practices of the Dong Sun people at this time. And if, if you can look very closely, I, you might be able to make out, here I can show you um, motifs of cranes, for instance. And if you go to Vietnam, I don't know if anybody's been to the city of Tang Hoa. This is in the northern part of Vietnam. I was there recently, and as we approached the city along the highway, we were confronted with this along the highway, this massive monument. And if you look, you can see there's a replica of a bronze drum right in the center here at the, at the foot. And then the motif of the cranes. So it shows how there is this very clear connection between the material record and ideas about the past that might be considered glorious and modern day identity. That sort of uh, motif, those, that set of motifs, is seen not just in monumental architecture in cities, but if you look at postcards, if you look at textbooks, if you look at packaging on tea, for instance, you see the same kinds of motifs. Here we have the tympanum of one of those bronze drums on the top of this tea box. This should not be surprising given the history, right? all of that complicated history with the Chinese that we see the Han Empire coming in and annexing this region and the Chinese staying for about a thousand years for many people in Vietnam, once independence was regained, there was a very concerted effort to search for the pre-colonial past, our ancestors before the Chinese came. That was the, the mission. So the Dong Sun culture figures very prominently in this story because it is the last prehistoric culture that existed in this region before the, the Han annexation period. The Han come at an ascribed date of 111 BCE. And we know that the Dongsun materials are spread out all throughout this area for several centuries before the Han arrived. That's one part of the archaeological backdrop. The second piece that I'd like to talk about is what's known as the Goldwas site. 
So here we have another image showing us the Red River. You can see the river from its source point up in the southwestern part of modern day China. This is the Yunnan province, that's Yunnan Plateau. We have the river coming down about 1,200 kilometers through the mountains before emptying out into the Gulf of Bakbo, also known as the Gulf of Tonkin. This is the delta here, right by the coast. And the site that I want to talk about, known as Goldwa, is located right in that delta. In fact, it's located right across the river itself from the modern day city of Hanoi. Uh, I love this image because it, to me, it, it encapsulates a couple of things, right? We can think about how this area uh, is very important in the national psyche and imagination for the Vietnamese people. We have the city of Hanoi. Uh, we also have what's known as the Tang Long or Hanoi Citadel. That was the capital of Vietnam centuries ago in the better part of the second millennium. And then we can go further back in time. So this is a game I like to play with my students. I don't know if you, you'll be able to see it, but can anybody spot the archaeological site? You don't have to answer the question, but let your eyes wander. If you look up here to the north, that is the site of Goldois located across the river. This is about 17 kilometers away from the outskirts of downtown Hanoi. And again, for me, this image is powerful when we think about how this particular geographic space has functioned as a kind of locus of political and cultural significance for Viet culture and, and society going back over 2,000 years. To give you another image, I'm sure you recognize this one. Right? <laughs> we are located right there. You can see um, the Biotechnology Center. We're sitting in the auditorium. Just to the southwest, you've got in that yellow shaded area, that's Camp Randall. I have that here. We'll come back to Camp Randall in just a second. But I want to give you a sense of scale. So when we think about the Goldwa site, along the same kinds of scale of size, this is the site itself, juxtaposed against where we are currently in Madison. I have a few more illustrations to give you uh, an idea. This is Central Park in New York City, Manhattan. And then the Goldwa site along the same scale. We can go elsewhere to other parts of the world. We can go to uh, the Nile and Egypt. We can see the Great Pyramid and Goldwa juxtaposed against that. I don't know if anybody's been to Cambodia and to Angkor, the very famous site of Angkor Wat, this massive temple and city uh, in Cambodia. This is Angkor Wat and we have the Goldwa site. If we go back to what I mentioned earlier, Randall, Camp Randall, the site of Goldwa is about 600 hectares in size, give or take. About 450 hectares enclosed by the outermost extent wall. This is roughly about 1,100 football fields in size. If we think about that, um, how many people have heard of this site before this lecture? This is one of the largest settlements found in the prehistoric record of Southeast Asia. Many people do not know about this site uh, for various reasons, but when we think about mainland Southeast Asia, a lot of people do know about places like Angkor or Angkor Wat, yet we have a site like this that predates some of those massive settlements. To give you an idea, uh, we're looking at the extant, this is a satellite fo photo showing the extant ramparts associated with Goldwa. Here we have the innermost wall, which is roughly rectangular in shape. This is about 1.65 kilometers in its perimeter, and it's punctuated by a series of bastions. Next we have the middle wall. This is about 6.5 kilometers around in its perimeter in this sort of irregular shape. And then we have the outermost wall. This is about eight kilometers around its perimeter. And the estimate is we're looking at anywhere between one to two million cubic meters of earthen soil materials that were moved in the construction of these ramparts. These are earthen rampart enclosures that were constructed that are associated with this particular settlement. If you look, um, you can see, if you go there today, some of these walls still stand in various states of disrepair up to 10 meters in height in some places. They are um, flanked on the exterior by moats or ditches. And the ditches potentially connected to the river system that eventually connected to the Red River itself that might have operated as a modern or as a kind of 
uh, thoroughfare of connection. And if you look at modern habitation at the site, you can notice right there in the middle, in that central area, how densely habitated it is today by modern uh, communities, which makes exploration and investigation a little bit challenging because we can't dig everywhere. We can't explore all of the areas of the site, particularly in those central areas that may have very interesting materials for us. So it, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, it makes the, the uh, efforts to test various hypotheses very complex and challenging. But one of the big debates that has been going on for quite some time is what, why do we see this here at this time and in this place? Who might have been responsible for the emergence of this massive settlement? And there are various theories about this. <laughs> I can guess that you've recognized this image if you're chuckling because we are looking at Monty Python and the Holy Grail. This is an image of King Arthur, one of my favorite depictions of King Arthur. Um, I have this here not because there is any connection. I'm not hypothesizing, nor have I heard any hypotheses <laughs> linking King Arthur to, uh, to uh, northern Vietnam in the Iron Age. However, why I think this is interesting to think about as a sort of analogy is because some, some of the legendary descriptions of King Arthur. Uh, we have the Lady of the Lake, for instance, offering Excalibur to the king, functioning as a source of power, of uh, emblem emblematic of authority, for instance. With Vietnam and the site of Gaulois, we have similar kinds of stories, legends. There is this tale of a magic turtle coming out of the water, talking to the very first king of what's known as the Olaf Kingdom, giving the king advice about building his kingdom. He overthrew the previous dynasty. He sets up his capital city at the Golwa area. The magic turtle gives him advice about how to construct his fortifications and defenses as he sets up his seat of power. Beyond that, the story says that the turtle also gives the king one of its claws and says, you use this as the magic uh, trigger mechanism for your crossbow. That will allow you to vanquish all of your enemies. We'll come back to that. I don't know if anybody knows where we are. We're not in Vietnam. This is a different part of the world. We are in uh, the UK. This is southwest England in the Cornish coast. There's a site known as Tintagel Castle, which many researchers suspect might be associated with some of the historical um, uh, records that are connected to King Arthur, potentially to King Arthur. So we have recent excavations at this particular location, uh, talking about Arthurian tales and legends. I have this here, again, as an analogy, because for us and for our story today, what's known as Camelot is very much the equivalent to the site of Golwa for the Vietnamese. It is their version of this capital city that functioned as the beginnings of the uh, various dynasties leading to the modern day. We have two sources, main sources of information when we reconstruct that history of Golwa. The first has to do with Vietnamese texts and traditions. There are various textual accounts that were recorded from 13th, 12th century onward in the medieval period of Vietnamese history. And as I mentioned before, many of my relatives and many people in Vietnam have grown up reading about this history as conventional wisdom, as conventional history. They talk about the, the occurrence of what's known as the Olaf Kingdom at an ascribed date of 258 BCE with the founding king known as An Zeng Vuong coming to power using Golwa as the, the capital uh, and taking advice from the magic turtle, building a series of earthen enclosures to protect that seat of power. The legends say that there were nine walls, not three, not the three that we see today, but that there were actually nine walls built in a kind of spiral shape in concentric circles, reminiscent of a snail shell's design. Now, we have this one source of information, but we can also talk about some issues that we might take with that source of information. Many of these tales were recorded, not officially recorded, into text until later. They were probably oral traditions and folk tales passed on through generations, but formally recorded after independence from the, the Chinese, so maybe well after. They discuss supernatural events, they discuss things like the magic turtle and so forth, so we have these potential challenges associated with these tales. Maybe there's an element of, of bias because of independence and a, a kind of search for this distant past. We also have supernatural details recorded as well. So we have issues that we can raise 
with that source of information. The other source of information that we have is Sinaitic texts. So after the Chinese come, we know that they record what they encounter, the people that they encounter. And for them, these were the barbarians to the south who needed to be civilized, who lacked elements of sophisticated farming practices, of governa governance, of bronze working, and so forth. And of course, we might take all of these depictions and these viewpoints with a grain of salt as well. Perhaps there is some element of imperial bias. But the upshot is that we've got these two conflicting depictions of what indigenous life here might have looked like, of what cultural life looked like before the onset of the Han. And if you put that into to a kind of nutshell, the debate might be, is quote unquote civilization brought here, imposed by an outside entity, namely the Han, or is it indigenous? Is it local? So we can point to a couple of different general models to explain this emergence of this particular city and the civilization. And what I would argue, what many of my colleagues argue, is that without the archaeological record, without that material data as a kind of arbiter, it would be very difficult to answer some of these questions. The big one, of course, is when does the city date to? Was it a byproduct of the arrival of the Han or does it predate all of that? This takes us to the next part of the lecture, which is our archaeological fieldwork. Now, a few decades ago, an historian by the name of Steve O'Hara at the University of Hawaii published this paper in a journal called Asian Perspectives. And in this particular paper, he talks about what the Chinese records claim and what we know from historical documents with the Vietnamese. And he laments that there is not enough archaeological material for us to address these questions. And I'll just pull out a couple of quotes from this. And he says, sometimes an old poem can tell you where to dig. And the one question of importance that can be addressed at the present moment would be to obtain reliable dating, materials and dating for the Goldwa site. And this is what my colleagues and I have tried to do uh, for the past 15 years or so. We've been conducting a systematic set of investigations and examining the rampart walls. Uh, we use the walls, the ramparts, as a proxy measure for the city itself, simply because we don't have access to the entire corpus of the material record for the city. As I mentioned before, we have a lot of habitation, modern habitation, in different parts of the areas, so we can't access all of that material. But we have endeavored to use the walls then as a proxy. When were the walls constructed? By whom? using what kinds of methods, and what can that tell us about the monumentality of this site, and perhaps that can be connected to the city itself. So I'll just briefly go through our data uh, and some of our highlights. We excavated over the course of three different field seasons um, portions of the inner wall, outer wall, and middle wall, all three of the visible uh, enclosures. And to generalize, we could determine that we have uh, three main chronological periods, which we'll generally label as early, middle, and late. And within these periods, we have specific phases of construction. Using the materials from the excavations, the profiles, looking at construction methods, using uh, artifacts and organic materials recovered, uh, we could determine that our main period of interest is this middle period, phases two, three, and four. And we have absolute dates and relative dates based on our recovered data. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. I first want to start with phase one. I mentioned the Dongsun culture uh, earlier in the, in the talk. That material has been found all over northern Vietnam, 100 different sites, right? Uh, we find Dongsun pottery here as well, stratified at the lowest levels underneath the rampart construction. We have evidence of Dongsun pottery. It shows that the Dongsun people were definitely in this area. What's interesting, though, is that these features and the materials don't seem to have a direct relationship to the rampart. It predates by a couple of centuries, and it has no clear structural relationship to what would follow. But what's interesting is, with the pottery that we find, we have radiocarbon dates spanning a period of about 500 to 300 BCE. Built on top of that, we have monumental construction layers of earthen materials deposited to build up this rampart feature. Here we have phases two, three, and four. This is what we would constitute as the middle period. And you can see with phase two, we have dumped earth, piled earth, clumps of 
of soil and clay pile up into this rampart feature. And then we have very clear layers of rammed earth, stamped earth, uh, into phase four. And this is where we find the bulk of our artifacts in phase four, roof tiles. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But the materials show us that that middle period spans the time period of 300 to 100 BCE, which is significant when we think about the ascribed date that the Chinese say that they arrived, 111 BCE. I'll return to that point in a little bit. In phase four, we find the bulk of our uh, artifacts for this ancient construction. Above that, we have refurbishment periods of the later historical periods. Uh, these episodes of reconstruction. But that middle period seems to be what's associated with the ancient rampart construction. And at the top of that, on the surface of that ancient wall, we have fragments of roof tiles. In fact, thousands of fragments of roof tiles. They're all over the site. It wasn't just in certain excavations, but if you cut through any part of the ramparts, where they put roads through, where the walls are eroding, you see the same stratigraphic layer of roof tiles. There are different ideas about why they're here. Maybe they were part of a roof-like structure that was sitting on top of the ancient wall. Maybe it's debris that was put, placed here to help shore up against erosion or monsoonal rains. That's still ongoing in terms of debate. Um, but what we do know is that the materials found with the roof tiles suggest that that construction, their presence, dates to this time period of 300 to 100 BCE. What's also interesting about the roof tiles is we don't find them anywhere else in northern Vietnam. Not at this time. There is only one place, one site, where we have roof tiles. And that's right here at Cô Luo. There are no roof tiles in northern Vietnam until centuries later. The suggestion is that perhaps the use of the tiles is very significant. That maybe there is something significant about this space, this one settlement. The other thing that people have found is inside the inner wall area. There are certain places where excavations could happen that, that are open. And my colleagues at the Institute of Archaeology in Vietnam, the National Archaeology Arm, um, conducted some investigations in that inner wall area. And they uncovered casting areas that have yielded evidence of sophisticated bronze working on a massive scale. So we have the molds for crossbow bolts made out of bronze. We have the trigger mechanisms made out of bronze as well for crossbows. The very famous bronze drum that was found at Goldoa was found in this vicinity as well. And this all speaks to something for us. If we put the materials together, it suggests that perhaps whoever was here and had control over this particular settlement likely had control over these methods of construction and manufacture as well. That the bronze working that we see, especially with weapons, might have been monopolized in some way by the centralized authority. Our subsequent excavations at various parts of the walls all show the same kinds of roof tiles as well as the same chronologies and construction methods, which suggests to us that we have probably one centralized authority responsible for the planning, the conception, and the direction of this monumental architecture, this project that probably involved lots and lots of population and labor. Uh, we have various estimates about how many hours it would have required, how many man hours and so forth, how much labor. Um, but we are probably looking at thousands of people, depending on how much time we're looking at. So if we put all this material together and we start thinking about the implications then. This is a statue that stands at the Goldwa site today. And you can see uh, the individual here. This is not the king, but it's someone else whom maybe the military advisor to the king. This is a commemoration of that person holding a crossbow. And I want to come back to that in just a second. But if we think about the idea of early Vietnam, I'm asked often, what does this mean for those particular legends? The Olak Kingdom, that famous uh, Anzum Vung king, and so forth. What I would say is we have tantalizing clues. We have evidence of monumentality. We have evidence of something powerful that's here before the Han come. So potentially some of those folk tales about this kingdom may be valid, or at least parts of those stories may be valid. We have clear evidence, but we don't have definitive proof that the king, that individual actually existed, 
or that kingdom existed. We don't have a tomb, for instance, of that king. We don't have anything in writing that would show conclusively that the tomb, ex that the king existed. So for me, I'm not quite willing to go out on that particular limb. What I am willing to say, however, is that given the material record that we have, all that evidence of monopolies over production, large labor pools, the monopolization of resources on this massive scale for this huge city that was completely unprecedented for the region at the time. Um, I'm comfortable to say that we have something that might be an ancient state, a kingdom if you like, that existed in this time period of 300 to 100 BCE. It predates the solidification of the Han Empire's control and annexation of this region. So from that standpoint, we are looking at something that is local and potentially indigenous that is separate from that later history. Now, whether or not this is definitive proof, whether or not this is related to modern day Vietnam, that's debatable. We're looking at changes through time, through a long stretch of time. But I'll come back to that in a little bit. If we go back to the idea of the barbarians and this notion that the Chinese were civilizing the barbarians to the south, uh, perhaps we can put that argument to bed and say, well, it depends on one's definition, of course. But what we see here is complex. It is politically complex, culturally complex. We have evidence of urbanism. We have evidence of early forms of ancient statehood, intensified kinds of rice farming, highly developed bronze working, and so forth. Now, does this mean that it was indigenous only and not foreign imposed as a kind of uh, complexity? Uh, I don't think so. I, my, my impression from looking at all the evidence is that we have clear connections within the region. It's probably a combination of factors. If we consider, for instance, where the Red River Delta is located, at the terminus of this Red River, we have connections up and down the Red River that might have functioned as a very important highway connecting various communities through parts of what is today southern China, southwestern China, as well as northern Vietnam. And we have access to the coast. Probably this is a very strategic hub of interaction. Lots of materials, lots of people and ideas coming in and out uh, exchanged throughout this period. The other thing to keep in mind as well is this happens right around the tail end of the Warring States period. And if we contemplate all of the push factors associated with conflict, it is conceivable that as the Warring States period is occurring, there are families, communities, that are moving, displaced. Just like my family was displaced in the 20th century, we can imagine 2,000 years ago, ideas and people being moved around as well. And so we have a combination of factors and interaction. <coughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're still doing. So my colleagues and I have been continuing our research, not just with the systematic investigation of the rampart features, but of other kinds of investigations. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Russ Quick, and I have been embarking on remote sensing and geophysical surveys around <coughs> the site of Kolo. And we've been using uh, magnetometry, for instance, to do uh, geophysical investigations and select sites around the city. Uh, this started a few years back, and we have hit just a small percentage of the available area. We need an army of people, so if anybody's interested, let me know. We can probably uh, take volunteers out to Vietnam. But it's just a, a small team of us right now. But I want to share a couple of highlights of some of the, the uh, geophysical methods that we've done. This is one area known as Location 12. As you can see, it's a rice paddy. So we have uh, access to certain farm areas. We're walking through these fields with the magnetometer, and if you look at the results, this is uh, an image showing us potential anomalies just below the surface that get picked up. And if you look here, there are these anomalies that were of interest. So we went and did ground truthing, test excavations in those areas to see what might be showing up. We don't know how deep or what materials might be there or what they date to, but we know that something is interesting under the ground, these targets. And in excavating, what we found were burials. These are burials that date to what's known as the Lei Dynasty. This is very recent, com comparatively speaking. This is 18th century. But in that particular burial, the human remains uh, did not 
did not uh, survive because of the acidity, acidity of the soils, but some of the burial items, the goods, did survive. So we have access to those materials, and we know that they date to that uh, late dynasty period. But it shows that potentially this method, this is proof of concept, right? This method is very productive and can show us in the future different areas that could be productive to examine and to ground truth. Another thing that we've done recently is we've obtained uh, LIDAR imagery. I don't know if anybody's familiar with LIDAR, so light detection and ranging. This is a technique um, that has really, really revolutionized our ability to, to do survey work in archaeology. So this has been done in different parts of the world with very successful results, parts of uh, Mesoamerica, parts of the United States, in parts of Southeast Asia. And we were able to obtain um, LIDAR data from entities in Vietnam that have been flying their own missions. And if you look at this image, what I would want to point out is this quadrant to the southwest. If we zoom in on that, what's interesting here is that the southwest corner of that inner wall area seems to be elevated. And potentially, there is another wall located around that southwest quadrant right over here. And if we look at some of the features on the outside, it suggests that perhaps we are looking at additional walling. Those legends talked about nine walls. And people have always said, well, we only see three. And maybe there were others, but we don't see them. Well, it's quite possible that we are seeing the remnants. At least we can identify where they may have st once stood 2,000 plus years ago through these kinds of methods. And we're hoping that these legends that talk about the snail shell design and the nine different walls, perhaps we might be able to find and identify areas of interest to test excavate and further test some of these hypotheses, these historical hypotheses as well. So we're trying to do that. We're trying to reconstruct some of these ancient environments as well by collecting uh, archaeobotanical samples to see what the landscapes might have looked like because the legends say that when the kingdom begins, the king arrives at the head of an army of tens of thousands of people, and they clear the forest from this area before they select it as the seat of their capital. Right? So this is part of the folk tales and legends. We don't know if it's accurate or not, but perhaps if we can reconstruct environments as they change over time, and when that, those changes happen, we might be able to come up with some of these, uh, these data sets. Now I want to just briefly talk a little bit about what this site and its history means for the Vietnamese people today. Um, this is an image, as I believe it was on the first title slide as well, this is an image showing festivals that happen annually at the Goloa site. It commemorates that legendary history and that king. They're in honor of these ancient ancestors that are venerated to this very day. So this happens every year at the Goloa site. And many, many people from all over the country congregate to, to participate in many of these activities. So just recently, I came across this. This is interesting for me, maybe for you as well. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of some of these video games where you have, you can choose characters that you pit against one another, called Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. Maybe you've heard of these video games. But the Vietnam, uh, in Vietnam, there's a version of a game like this. And one of the characters you can choose is this person. And if you look closely, you can make out something in his hands. That is a magic crossbow. This is that legendary king used in this video game in popular culture in Vietnam. So we see these legendary stories, these descriptions, they, these colorful tales that, that are part of not only textbook and historical, uh, historical education, but they're part of popular culture, just like the Dong Sun materials and those motifs that I showed earlier. We see them on monuments. We see them on postcards all over pop culture as well. If you go to Cold Wall today, not only will you see the extant ramparts that are still there in disrepair, but you can go to visit the museum, the exhibition center. And there are uh, materials on display. There are festivals that happen at the site, as I mentioned. And there are lots of people from all over Vietnam, but all over the world, actually, that come to visit this site and to visit this history. This may or may not look familiar. That is the set of walls, and this is um, the product of school children. Field trips to the site showing the history of the Viet 
uh, civilization and people, with school children being inspired to take uh, clay, maybe we would use Plato here, and reconstruct the walls at Gaulois. Not only do we see that happening as part of the educational process, but we see replicas of the crossbows being handed over to kids to test fire at targets to celebrate and commemorate this particular historic episode. I mentioned that the, the Han Empire comes in at 111 BCE. They solidify control, and the Chinese would stay for about 1,000 years. There are different dynasties that come in and out of the picture, but effectively, they retain control for that first millennium of the Common Era. There are different periods, but they're called the domination periods, right? brief periods of revolt and uh, uprising, but essentially the Chinese would stay for about 1,000 years. At the end of that period, right around 1,000, right, the Vietnamese regain independence in that 10th century. And the first person who comes to power is, is a king by the name of Ngo Quyn in the 10th century. And what's interesting about that history is apparently, according to text, Ngo Quyn comes to power and instead of using the area of Hanoi, where Hanoi is located today, that had been the locus of power when the Chinese were there, instead of using that area as his seat of power, he goes back across the river to the ancient site of Gaulois, and he uses that as the capital. We don't know exactly why, but we might guess perhaps this is a symbolic gesture, nodding back towards the ancestors, that people that he might consider local indigenous ancestors of the Viet this pre-colonial, pre-colonized past. And this suggests that perhaps that political strategy not only was effective in rallying people, but it also indicates that these stories probably persisted, echoing through the centuries. From the time that these communities existed, that we see that associated with that ancient city, right through to that time period of the 10th century, and arguably right through to the present day. If we contemplate the various rituals and ceremonies that still happen at Gaulois, the ideas that are still propagated, this connection between politics, history, cultural identity, and the management of heritage, all intertwined right through to the 20th century when Ho Chi Minh gives that Declaration of Independence, invoking his ancestors from over 2,000 years ago. We can argue that the archaeological record then has been mined and continues to be mined as this very rich foundation of cultural material, the cultural past intersecting with the modern day identity of the Viet people. Now, I've been working at Gola for quite some time, and this has been an honor and a privilege to be able to work on this episode of my ancestry. Um, we were also very fortunate to have a lot of interest. So as we were excavating, we had folks coming to the site, other researchers from around Vietnam and outside of it, tourists as well, but also political figures, the deputy prime minister, the former president of the country, coming to visit the site as we were excavating to ask us, what are you finding? What's coming out of the ground here? And we might imagine part of that might be curiosity, intellectual kind of curiosity, but part of it might also be how might this change our view of the past? How might this change our kind of political views about the contrast with the Chinese, for instance? But again, showing us the present day stakeholders and how everyone has a sort of vested interest in this cultural past. There is one conservation agency, a preservation agency that is in charge of the site, manages the property, and is seeking UNESCO World Heritage Site status for Gaulois. Um, if you go to the website of this conservation agency, the descriptions of the Gaulois site are interesting. They talk very specifically about the king and the kingdom, not as conjecture, not as hypothesis, but as fact, historical fact. I've been working with my colleagues at this agency for quite some time, and they asked me to produce uh, a, a publication for them on behalf of their agency that describes our findings and our research, our archaeological work. And I have this here just to highlight the preface. This is the preface in Vietnamese, but there's an English trans translation. And in this translation, what you can make out, maybe not, but the font is really small, but I'll, I'll just kind of highlight this. Essentially, we've come to this very happy compromise where I might say the material record we can push so far to give us ideas about political complexity in this ancient state that existed. 
Whereas my colleagues in the agency will say, well, this is definitive proof. It's not just archaeological uh, evidence for complex civilization. This is proof of the existence of that historical figure. Which raises for us this interesting question about who can claim the past, who owns the past, who has the right to generate knowledge about it, to communicate and disseminate that knowledge as well. And I think that if we look at the law as a kind of case study, it highlights the very complex nature of these kinds of topics, and debates, and connections. It highlights the very complicated practices of archaeology increasingly, whether you were talking about Vietnam or the United States or elsewhere in the world, where there are varied stakeholders and varied voices that might come to the table and have very different interpretations of the material record. We might be looking at the same set of data, the same artifacts, the same sites, the same landscapes. They might mean different things to us, though, and how we might interpret them might be varied. But I think this illustrates the importance of being aware of that so that we bring varied voices to the table. I just want to end with one final slide. Uh, I mentioned my barbarian ancestry, and I showed that image of my parents on their wedding day. This is my parents in the modern day. So this is uh, July of 2020. They had retired. We lived in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. As Tom mentioned, I went to high school in Lincoln Park. Um, but after uh, my folks retired, they moved out of Chicago to Arizona, to right outside the Phoenix area, where they lived for about 20 years or so, right up until a couple of years ago when the pandemic started to become an issue for all of us. And we came up with this very complicated strategy to get them out because we were worried about them being on their own in Arizona. So we wanted to move them closer to us and family here, to their grandkids and so forth. So uh, we concocted this very elaborate extraction plan. And it, when, when this all happened, it, it was funny and ironic to, to, to my parents. When I finally got them to Madison, they were laughing. And I asked them what was so funny. I said, because we've totally turned the, the roles, the tables. We carried you <laughs> out of turmoil when you were a baby. And here you are now bringing us out of, of danger um, into Madison. But I'm happy to report that they are doing well. And um, they have been back to Vietnam, uh, at least on several occasions, and are celebrating some of this history. And, and they are very, very happy that I'm able to do this work in Vietnam. Even though when we left, the thought was there'd be never any kind of connection back to the country again. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for your, your patience and your interest, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Questions? Oh, oh my gosh. This is so amazing. I just want to say just a spectacular information, and uh, I'm so impressed. Uh, I am curious about the... Um, scientific analysis that you've been using, and I saw in one of your slides this idea of using thermal luminescence as in addition to carbon-14 dating. Can yeah. you speak a little bit about what, what, how you use that to do some of your work? Yeah, so the thermal luminescence, I'm not an expert with that, that particular method, but my understanding of it is uh, with those ceramic materials, it is an, a, the ability to see when they were fired at a certain temperature, when, when they were last exposed to that temperature, uh, either that or forms of, of sunlight. And that gives you a kind of bracket for chronology. So that was used in conjunction with the radiocarbon dates from organic materials, and they were consistent with one another. So we used various independent means to try to get at these chronologies. Um, and all of the, the, the materials that we had from the different places, the different excavations around the site, all seemed to dovetail around that time period. Now, it's a big window still. so it's possible that we might be able to refine it even further. The other thing that I didn't talk about here was I, I say that there's a window of 300 to 100, but it's also quite possible that the window is even smaller for the actual construction of those walls because we don't see a lot of depositional episodes between the layers. So some of my colleagues have actually hypothesized that perhaps we're looking at construction in a matter of years or decades as opposed to over the course of two centuries or so. But we have that just as a sort of conservative approach. I'm hoping that in the future, as more and more data are collected, we will be able to refine some of that chronology. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oops.
Yeah, great talk. Um, so uh, what about the genetic history? Uh, can you define, 300 years is pretty tight to do a genetic analysis, yeah. um, but does, is there any, and how about linguistically? Can you backdate yeah. when the, the language was affected by the Han? Yeah, uh, I, just remember, I think I'm supposed to be repeating the question, is that right? You're okay, because oh, we, well, we have mics. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so the two questions, genetic history as well as the linguistic history. Um, with the former, it's, it's difficult to say. We just don't have enough information yet. So part of the issue is preservation. We don't have a lot of uh, human remains that we can speak to from that specific window in that time period. That combined with um, the, the application of the method within the region, within Southeast Asia, that's still kind of in its infancy. So I have colleagues that are working on some of these questions, but they're looking at different time periods. For instance, they're looking at the expansion of rice farming practices. The suspicion is that they're coming from parts of southern China because we know that wet rice is likely, at least this variety is likely domesticated in parts of southern China, in the Yangtze River Valley, for instance, and that those farming practices go back for millennia before this time period, and those practices are probably coming down with migrating people movements of people. So that genetic kind of uh, fingerprinting has been applied to those kinds of questions, not necessarily to this time period. The second part of the question, though, is a little bit more uh, relevant for us, the linguistic evidence. So I have colleagues who are doing linguistic reconstructions, and they're trying to find connections between um, the various communities that existed, not just in the Red River Valley, but outside of it in Southeast Asia and parts of southern China and how they might be connected to certain artifacts, um, the, the root words for certain tools, certain kinds of practices. All of those have been kind of uh, hypothesized about. The issue for us, though, is we do not know for that time period, say 300 BCE, what language was being spoken right there in that time and place. There are many possibilities. And through linguistic kinds of reconstructions that go back and trace generational change, we have hypotheses, but we simply don't have a definitive answer. Which is part of the reason why, for me, when people say that these are the ancestors of the Viet people, in some ways, yes, but there is no clear connection from 2,000 plus years ago through to the 21st century. It's difficult to make that connection. It'd be like saying the Gauls were connected to the modern day French, or the Jomon would be connected to the modern day Japanese, right? It, there is, millennia of change that, that have to be considered. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, two uh, brief questions. Uh, the first is, um, could you explain the reasons for the historic enmity between the Vietnamese and the Khmer? And would that be somewhat similar as far as the, in explaining the expansion of the Vietnamese into Cambodia, a similar desire to uh, extend civilization, in quotes? My other question, uh, doesn't Dalat in the Central Highlands have UNESCO heritage status now? And what is the reason for giving Dalat that status? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, with the first question, it's, it's hard for me to comment too much about that. I, I'm not a modern historian, so I don't know how I would answer that, uh, especially if we want to ask the question about if it's analogous to some of these previous historical episodes and the motivations for expansion. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that Vietnam, as it looks today, is very recent, relatively speaking. So we can talk about the northern part of the country as the epicenter, the crucible. But subsequent to that, we see expansion from that area of the Viet, the Dai Viet, southward into areas of central Vietnam, where the, the Cham cultures were located into areas further south towards the Mekong Delta. Mm -hmm. It's a very complicated tapestry of history with lots of different ethnic identities and groups and cultural histories. So that is sort of uh, the backdrop to, to say it's a complicated question and a complicated answer. I, I don't know if I can answer that uh, accurately or with, with any kind of authority. Um, your other question about Dalat, 
I believe that is the case. And there are several sites throughout the country that are deemed uh, World Heritage Sites. There are uh, citadels. There are other kinds of sites. There are also forms of intangible heritage that are all part of that. Um, I think we can talk about World Heritage Sites that exist all over the world. And the Vietnamese can, can point to various parts of their history. Maybe and this is sort of connected to the first question. It's a very complicated set of histories mm -hmm. that span centuries, if not millennia. And so there are many sites that are associated with that. So some of those sites, like the, the Ho Citadel, for instance, are, are connected to dynasties that are uh, later in time. Uh, the, the Lei Dynasty, the Nguyen, and so forth, all part of this, this long period of cultural change and trajectories. Mm -hmm. But um, I think in terms of how sites get selected, that's something that uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a very complicated process of vetting and evaluation. And there are probably a lot of different players within Vietnam itself who, for various motivations, want one site to be uh, prioritized over another. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You had a picture of a very deep excavation, rectangular solid. Could you go back to that and sure. tell us? about that. That's one of the deepest things. This one? Yeah. How deep is that in feet? Because I don't think in meters. <laughs> and Or just tell me meters and I'll multiply it times three. Um, um, and where, what are yeah. you getting out of something that This was uh, an excavation I connected to the inner wall. And I think we're probably, I want to say this is about three meters or so. So close to 15 feet. And this was a portion of one of the suspected bastions associated with the inner wall. So our, our idea was, you know, when we were looking at the various ramparts, we wanted to see if they were contemporaneous, if they had the same kinds of materials and artifacts and construction profiles, because that would be part of the, the larger argument that maybe it's the same society or same authority responsible for all this entire system, or if we're looking at piecemeal construction over time. Um, so part of this was the inner wall itself. If you look at the image, uh, here, I'll show another image. The inner wall is rectangular. The other walls, the middle and outer, are irregular in shape. So this has prompted a lot of speculation. Why is that inner wall different? And the other part of the speculation is when we think about cities in China, a lot of the ancient cities that predate this site, in fact, are rectilinear with their outer enclosures and walls. So some people argue that perhaps even if parts of the site were indigenous, that it, that inner wall was late that it was constructed after the Han arrived, and they plopped themselves down in the middle of the site, and they constructed that inner wall with the bastions, with gates, and so forth. So we wanted to see, is that valid? Do we have any indications that it's from a later time period? Um, the material showed that it's contemporaneous, that we have the inner wall being constructed at the same time, using the same kinds of methods, the same kinds of roof tiles, all part of that history. Why it's different? Uh, in terms of the shape and morphology. The suspicion is we are looking at expedient construction with the outer walls. People are probably connecting various areas that are elevated or hills, and they're f following the contours of the landscape to save energy and time and materials in, in order to produce all that. The idea is that at this time, and we suspect these are fortifications, by the way. I didn't, I didn't talk about this specifically. The reason we think these are fortifications is because we see bastions not just in the middle or the inner wall, but we're starting to see them along the outer perimeters as well. And bastions are very telltale signs of defensive concern. And the idea here is if it's happening in the third century BCE, there is the likelihood that they are building for a scale of threat that's unprecedented for the region. This is not against the other kinds of smaller scale communities that are in the area. They have an eye to the north, probably. And if there's expansion with the Qin dynasty, that the terracotta soldiers and the, the emperor of the Qin, or the Han, 
maybe there is a concern that somebody's going to come across those mountains at some point with a very large force. And so this scale of construction might be poised against that. Well, thank you for your excellent uh, storytelling. And to bring it back to Camp Randall, yeah. uh, and uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, we, we had uh, the history of dugout canoes in Wisconsin. So I wonder what kind of wa uh, water vessels that you showed uh, being buried there and if they were similar to a dugout canoe. I think some of them, from my understanding, are, are similar. Um, but some might be more elaborate as well. So the reason I say this is, if we go back to some of these images, I think at the beginning we showed some of the boat coffin burials, which to my mind are somewhat reminiscent of some of those dugout canoes. However, on some of the bronzes, we have iconography, and pardon the time here, there are way too many slides. Oh, there might be a faster way to do this. That image in the center uh, depicts a boat. And this would be a fair amount larger than some of those dugout canoes that I think uh, my colleagues showed a couple weeks ago. And what we see here uh, is interesting, because if you look closely, it's hard to make out in this image, but right here, you can see a, what looks like a bronze drum sitting underneath a platform. There is an individual on top of these platforms, maybe holding a bow. There are, appear to be individuals with very elaborate headdresses, maybe plumed with feathers. Some of them appear to be holding spears. And in some of these images, we can see individuals sitting, maybe at spear point, on the boat. The interpretation for some people is that these are war parties that these boats are being used to transport large groups of people up and down the river system, potentially for raiding activities. And so there are indications that perhaps before the, the city itself is constructed, we have forms of conflict and competition between smaller scale communities located in this area. Remember the Dong Sun I mentioned, 100 different sites have been found scattered throughout this entire region. But those boats are probably used for this kind of very um, specific function, among other functions, most likely, along this river system. So probably you have people moving materials and people for trade and exchange, <coughs> for migration, but also potentially for competition. And one idea is that perhaps the location of ore, precious ore materials in different places, especially for, for sophisticated bronze work, because you don't naturally find copper and tin always in the same place, you have to have knowledge of where these locations are, the sources, and maybe you have to have access to them. So potentially we're seeing competition for the ability to, to procure those resources. Online, Dareth is asking, has there been any dendrochronology dating done on the trees that make the boat burial containers? It would seem possible on the 18th century burials. Yeah. So uh, we have not done it in our direct projects, but I know that um, some colleagues have done dendrochronology for more recent historic episodes. Uh, I remember reading a paper recently over the last few years, um, samples that were analyzed, but we're looking at records from the last couple of centuries. For two millennia ago, that I don't know. I don't think we've had any kind of systematic analysis of dendrochronology and results. Um, we do have radiocarbon analysis, but not dendrochronology that I know of. And then uh, I have a question on terminology. I heard you say diviet. Yes. What does diviet mean? So diviet is the name of, uh, is sort of a, the, the moniker for the, the Viet state or dynasty that emerges after the Han period or the Sinaitic period ends. So uh, it's contemporaneous then with Angkor, for instance, in Cambodia, uh, with other communities in that second millennium. So Daiviet is the appellation for the, the state. Is it related at all to the phrase Dai Nippon, like greater Japan? I, I think it is, etymolog etymologically, yes. Wow, okay. Yeah. So that's something that I find very fascinating as well, is on the outskirts, the so-called barbarian fringes, 
of, of a Sinaitic civilization, we see the Korean Peninsula, we see the Japanese islands, we see northern Vietnam, and so forth. Because of my ancestry, I had grown up speaking Vietnamese and Korean, and I've noticed linguistic similarities wow. between the two, and I, it all points back to the, the Chinese uh, influence, the impact that the annexation periods had, not just on language and customs, but also on construction methods and so forth. So we see that. The use of chopsticks, for instance, tends to be in these areas outside of the Sinaitic sphere of cultural influence. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was significant to point out that a paper that you showed briefly that was written by the professor at the University of Hawaii yeah. was dated September of 1978, which interestingly enough was a period when uh, Vietnam and China were actually at war. So I think you see here an example of a conflict that simmers, has been simmering over s several millennia. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the tensions still exist to the present day. Right. I'm sure many people in the room are familiar with the South China Sea disputes. Mm -hmm. um, in Vietnam, the South China Sea is known as the Eastern Sea, not the South China Sea. And this is um, part, partly because of national pride, but also political reasons and motivations. So those, those uh, various claims over the Spratly Islands and so forth, uh, increasingly what's interesting about that is we see the, the Chinese government and the military building up artificial islands to bolster some of their claims. We also see, for instance, the use of archaeological materials pressed into these claims. So people are saying, you know, if you find material evidence of our ancestors in some of these islands, it shows that we controlled these islands for centuries, if not millennia. Therefore, our claims are valid. Either we, we control the entire sea or we can control certain islands. We have several claimants all throughout this region, all pressing in their claims, some of them using archaeology. Yeah. It's like the Persian Gulf versus the Arabian Gulf. Sure. Yeah. OK, a uh, question I have uh, based on the settlement, is it, uh, was it more based on natural topography, or is there like an astrological influence on how they built the settlement itself yeah. and placed it? Yeah. That's a very good question. I have not seen a lot of uh, argumentation around um, a kind of significance from a spiritual or celestial perspective. Uh, most of the arguments that I've seen are from a sort of environmental or practical argument that we have a, an area that is near the river that is elevated, that has very rich uh, soil for agricultural purposes. So based on the topography, the argument has always been that the expedient way to construct a city and to take advantage of this location is to connect some of those landscape features. Now, it is quite possible that some of the other features associated with the site, where the gates might be located, for instance, or some of the major um, uh, roads or waterways might be located. That might be tied to some of these other kinds of concerns. It's hard for us to know, though. Without descriptions, without text, we would be just hypothesizing about this. But one thing that might be important to think about is we do have, as I mentioned, some of the evidence for gates. The main entrance appears to be in one area specifically. That we can tell because um, to the south, where the walls are closest together, all three of the extant walls, we have not only um, a pathway through, but also on the exterior parts, we have evidence of other architectural features, like screens, for instance, that might have been defensive. So there seems to be baffling of some of the rampart features in that area, uh, suggesting that there are main entrances or gates. There are commanding views from elevated positions so that if people are coming to that main entrance or coming by boat or by foot, you'd have the ability to see, uh, as well, direct fire if you needed to. But um, that would be as far as I could, I could push it. I'd be interested to hear if others have any ideas. And if you have any ideas, I'd be interested to hear it. I hope I didn't miss this, but uh, at this time, what, what was like the rest of what we know as Vietnam today doing then? Yeah. 
or what was it or yeah um a lot of similar things except for that massive city that seems to be anomalous else and i mentioned that, that nowhere else do we see roof tiles for instance for several centuries there are roof tiles in china however from that time period and what's interesting about that is and i'll come back to your question in a second i just want to go on this tangent the roof tiles in china they're very similar in the design and morphology and they're associated with capital cities and royal architecture so because we see them in this area of vietnam people have also wondered is this because the han came in and they built Goldwa, and they built these buildings and these and they use roof tiles to represent their cities uh, because of the dates and the material record, we think that all that predates the Han arrival. However, it does suggest possible emulation, that whoever was in power here, the locals, they were familiar with exotic forms of authority and power, exotic forms of uh, government buildings, for instance, and perhaps they were appropriating those kinds of symbols and using them locally, emulating. The roof tiles in China have synodic characters, many of them, on the tiles. In Vietnam, there are no characters. We see a star-shaped motif, which is very similar to the designs on top of the, the tympanum of the drum. So it seems to be local. Your question was about what else is happening elsewhere in Vietnam. Um, we have other cultures from that time period, the Sahuin to the central, uh, just to the south and central Vietnam, for instance. They have similar kinds of uh, cultural practices um, we don't see any cities like this. They have, uh, they're kind of a coastal society. They're very maritime oriented. We have burials in jars, for instance, so it's different than the boat coffins that we see up in the north. Um, but all throughout this area and further afield in parts of Southeast Asia, we have similar kinds of rice farming societies of this kind of scale. And it's clear that there's exchange that's happening between them. What happens with Goldwa, however, is very anomalous. And the suspicion is there's probably some kind of connection to what's happening in China. Not directly, but maybe indirectly. Yeah. So I noticed you used the word Viet. Yes. Can you go through for me and perhaps for others the difference between Vietnam spelled the way that there are two uh, hyphenated, two words, yeah. These are all versions that I grew up with in the 60s. Yeah. The journal is called the Journal of Vietnamese Studies, and yet you've said Viet. Yeah. And can you, which ones are for the people, which ones are for the land, the country, that type of thing? And it's, has it changed over time, or is it just it, I'm it, hearing it things? Has, it has changed over time, and it continues to change over time. I'm shocked. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, as one who had imagined, and it, my, my talk probably reflect some of that change and the conflicts that we might experience because of that. Um, the, when the Ola Kingdom is first overthrown, it's not by the Han. It's by another kingdom according to historical text. That kingdom is known as Nam Viet. And there's a, a Chinese way of saying Nam Viet, Nan Yue. And according to some of these tales, it is potentially someone from southern China, maybe a renegade general, someone who has set up their own kingdom of Nanyue in southeastern China. This is in parts along the coast that takes over. There are legends about how this happens. According to the legends, the daughter of the king marries this rival king's son, this prince. He convinces her to take the magic crossbow and bring it to him. This prince gives it to his father. The father attacks end of the, the dynasty. And there's a tragic story because the king then learns he's betrayed by his daughter and he beheads her. I didn't talk about this, but that's part of the legend. So I went off on a tangent, but your question is about these appellations. So Nan Yue, Nam Viet. Um, Nam means south. Yue is the identity of, for the, for the Chinese, Yue was a, a name given to many of the tribes in the southern part of what is now southern China. It was a, a, a kind of categorical description of all of the different identities enveloped in this one umbrella of Yue. These were the barbarians of the south. And so Nam Yue, Nan Yue is the people to the furthest south. So it's interesting that the name has stuck 
um, because in some ways there is kind of pushback, cultural resistance to whatever, why should we have the name that was given to us by others, particularly from the North, but because it has stuck, because that 1,000 years did have an impact, people learned to write in, with Chinese characters. People wanted to say, we have our version of a kingdom, an empire, like our neighbors to the north. So some of those names stuck, and they have persisted through to the, to the current day. I use Viet because um, for some people, instead of saying Vietnam or Vietnamese, it is the, the Yue identity or Viet cultural identity. That's the larger kind of cultural umbrella. But it's used in different ways and interchangeably. And what is the name of the language? Uh, it's Viet. Not we, Vietnamese. We, we say Ding, Ding is language, Ding okay. Viet. So it, in, in English it's Vietnamese, but it's the word oh, Viet. Okay. Yeah. Good. Great. Other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions afterwards as well. Thank Excellent. Thank you.